Hello, everyone, again. Uh, it's Employment Day. Uh, so we are now doing this uh, YouTube video uh, on Employment Day uh, when there's not a, a crisis. Uh, before we get into uh, the discussions today or the topics today, uh, I'd like to mention uh, that at the end of this video, we will put uh, a link uh, or we'll or give you a link so that uh, you can take a, a look at our swag for good. Uh, now, this is by popular request, the swag, and we thought uh, as part of our uh, corporate responsibility that uh, we could uh, we could uh, allocate all the profits to uh, charitable organizations really focused on on getting us out of the COVID-19 crisis, especially those who have been hardest hit. Uh, so take a look. Uh, we hope you like it. Um, very proud of our marketing team led by Sebastian uh, who really put all of this together. So with that, uh, I'll go through the normal drill, fiscal policy, there's a lot to say there, uh, monetary policy, uh, market indicators, uh, economic indicators, and uh, a bit about innovation. And before I start, I know I've got why we do uh, these macro uh, videos when we're all about innovation. Well, I started my career in economics. Art Laffer of Laffer Curve fame uh, was my professor uh, at USC. And uh, I've always felt it important to have perspective, just have a sense of the economic uh, backdrop and the policy backdrop uh, before I can really delve into any investing. Uh, so that's that's one reason. The other reason is uh, because of my background and because I did start in the business in economics, I uh, devour economic reports as they come out. It's a little bit of my daily diet. Uh, and I've noticed over the years that uh, there's there's there are a lot of shortcuts in reporting. Uh, there's a lot of detail in uh, in the reports. And I don't hear a lot of details being mentioned when they are quite relevant. And that was true, especially during the coronavirus uh, crisis. Now, I know we're still uh, in somewhat of a crisis, but at the depths, uh, it, it became easy to see very early on that we would end up in a V-shaped recovery. And I think uh, delving into deeply into those reports helped us uh, with that point of view, and I hope it helped you as well. Uh, so we will um, start with fiscal policy. Uh, 1.9 trillion, it looks, it looks like that could be the case. Um, went through the S Senate, Vice uh, President Harris uh, uh, decided it, he, she was the deciding vote. Uh, and now it will go back to the House. Uh, Nancy Pelosi says she will have a bill no later than March uh, 15th. So um, we may not get the 1.9 trillion, but it's going to be much closer to that than I expected. Uh, I expected uh, a bit of a rapprochement uh, at the beginning of the Biden administration. And um, what we're seeing instead is um, the uh, uh, a decided turn really to our decision to overturn uh, a lot of uh, the decisions that President Trump made and uh, to push through this fiscal stimulus package uh, aggressively. Now, even Larry Summers, who uh, was, I think, the top economist on President Obama's team, is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, the economy is already well on its way, and this is going to set it on fire. And uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, so, uh, and that will be a good thing. We will have a, a lot more jobs, but we will have a lot more policy decisions to make uh, as uh, the deficit mounts and uh, maybe some inflation indicators start uh, flagging here. Uh, so uh, we will also see, I think, potentially the $15 minimum wage. Again, good for some, but I actually think that, that it will backfire. A lot of small businesses will not be able to uh, afford it. And hopefully they 
uh, will be able to get through to the administration because it is those businesses that the Biden administration says need so much help and, and they're right. A $15 uh, minimum wage uh, will, not, will, will not help, we believe. Um, um, monetary policy, well, M2 is still at 20, it's north of 25% still. And uh, so far we're seeing uh, the ramifications uh, in asset prices. So stocks, bonds, uh, uh, housing in particular, uh, the, those assets are the beneficiaries of this very generous monetary policy. And uh, we know that uh, Chairman Powell uh, says it's way too premature to think about pulling back. Uh, even though the bond market itself is saying, uh, well, it looks like the 10-year inflation expectations are 2.2%. Uh, the uh, Fed wants north of 2%, but it wants to see the whites of the eyes of inflation at uh, 2% or more. Uh, that will happen. And it will happen if for no other reason than the, the base effect. Last year, we were seeing declining prices during March and April, uh, prices dropping at a rapid rate. And we're going to cycle against uh, those comparisons. So we could see the CPI up at 4% uh, by, by the summer. Uh, I still do not believe that the Fed will flinch. Uh, they will say this is temporary. It's just because of the comparisons, the base effect. And uh, it's probably going to allow inflation to say, stay higher for, for longer uh, than might have been the, the case in the past. Now, if you've been listening to us, we do not believe there will be an underlying inflation problem. In fact, the, the technologies around which we focus all of our research are all deflationary, and they're all hitting prime time in terms of exponential growth. So they're going to become more important, and the deflationary undercurrents in the eco economy are going to multiply, we believe. The other thing that's going to happen is there are a lot of companies, sectors, industries in harm's way because uh, of innovation and also because especially the more mature ones have been leveraging up to buy back their stock and pay dividends when instead they should have been investing aggressively uh, so that they won't be disintermediated and disrupted as these innovation platforms just plow across uh, the economies uh, around the world. Uh, so we're probably going to see uh, both deflationary booms associated with these innovation platforms and deflationary busts associated with companies that are, are going to have to try and sell their wares at any uh, price uh, in order to service their debt as they are being disrupted or disintermediated. So those are two sources of uh, deflationary power. Uh, one of them's good deflation, again, technological, and it will be associated with very rapid growth. The other one is bad deflation. And this is the deflation uh, that Jeffrey Gundlach and Howard Marks and other more fixed income investors uh, have been warning us about. Uh, and I agree with them. There, there is trouble on the horizon. Uh, the fixed income markets are not discerning uh, quite enough yet. In fact, hardly at all. Uh, so we think there are going to be a lot of ramifications, especially for the fixed income markets. Um, as far as uh, the, uh, the uh, equity markets, uh, we're ha we've had a great uh, profit season generally. Uh, the V-shaped recovery is benefiting most industries, save for travel, leisure, hospitality, uh, those uh, and other service uh, sectors uh, probably will catch a little fire this year um, as the vaccinations make their way uh, through, through the population here and, and elsewhere. Uh, so earnings are looking really good. 
Uh, now, there are some very highly valued uh, stocks out there. Uh, they can't miss. So they do get hit if they, um, if they miss. So I'm glad to see the market is discerning. It's a sign we're not in a bubble. Um, we're seeing commodity prices. Uh, they're really starting to gain traction here. Uh, so another sign that the economy is, um, is doing very well. And uh, we're seeing a counter trend rally in the dollar. The dollar has moved up against most uh, expectations during the last, um, during the last uh, month or so. Uh, if, if the fiscal program that uh, the Biden administration uh, has proposed does find its way uh, uh, through Congress, uh, then uh, I believe the dollar could uh, start to uh, go down again, mostly with a focus on, on uh, the fiscal deficit. There is um, a counterbalance to that uh, somewhat, and that is our trade deficit is probably going to come down as, uh, as more spending shifts back to services, which is more domestic economy, uh, from goods, which uh, many of our goods are imported. So that, that could give the dollar a bit of a, a, a reprieve from the downturn that has been in place for about a year. Um, we'll see what the markets focus on more, the fiscal deficit or the trade deficit. Uh, so that will be an interesting dichotomy. Uh, as far as the economy, the employment report, this is what I mean by looking into the report. Uh, the, the employment report, the headline numbers were mixed. The unemployment rate itself came down from 6.7% to 6.3%, which was much better than the 6.7% expected. Uh, but employment itself, non-farm pay payroll employment, was 49,000. I think the expectation was a little north uh, of 100,000. Uh, that is the number that most economists pay uh, most attention to. And uh, what we think they missed in this report uh, were a couple of things. One, the average work week went up uh, 0.3 hours, which is a huge increase. Uh, and it means, and it is, it will be associated uh, with a lot of economic activity. Sometimes the, that hours worked, and I've rarely seen it go up 0.3 hours during any one month. Uh, sometimes, and that is much more important uh, than the headline numbers. The other number that did not get a lot of attention was the average hourly earnings. Uh, they were up 0.2, expectation was 0.3, but the previous month was revised up from uh, 0 0.8 to 1.2, I mean, to 1.0. Uh, so uh, those two numbers were, I would say, on balance, better than expected. And I put a lot of weight on that average work week. So I think the economy is doing much better than uh, the Biden administration is suggesting as it is trying to push through this very um, sizable fiscal policy package. In fact, um, I think this package is three times the size of the one put in place at, at the beginning of the Obama administration as they were addressing the worst financial crisis we've had since the, the Great Depression. So uh, again, we think uh, a fiscal policy package of this size is overdoing it. Uh, then we have housing, it's on fire. I probably don't have to tell anyone uh, here listening uh, uh, that news um, because if you're a homeowner, you know this. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that's a source of great confidence. Capital spending looks great. We got uh, uh, non-defense capital goods orders this week, uh, still going strong. Inventories have started to increase, but I would, uh, uh, note that commodity prices are also continuing to increase, which suggests that the inventories are uh, trying to catch up to where consumption has, um, has evolved over the past year. So inventories going up is absolutely essential. And we do think we're going to get uh, a lot of growth from inventory growth uh, before, uh, before they reach excessive levels. 
uh, government spending, I just told you, that's going to be a source of great strength. And even the trade uh, deficit will probably be a source of strength as we import fewer uh, goods uh, relative to uh, the spending that's going to take place in the service sector. I think all this, uh, uh, all this will wind up in some significant profit growth this year. I think much more significant than uh, many economists and strategists expect. expect. I think this last uh, video I did, uh, I said $200 for the S&P 500. That would be a run rate at the end of this year, but it actually, it could be close to that for the year as a whole if um, some of these explosive um, fiscal policy measures uh, 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 continue. One of the things that will happen if we get this fiscal policy package is the saving rate uh, will go, it's already started to move up again. It will go uh, from 13.7, probably back to 20% or even north. It peaked at 34% during the depths of the crisis. That is a huge amount of firepower uh, that the consumer has. Uh, moving forward. So the consumer will be benefiting uh, from a nice cushion, uh, good uh, confidence associated with jobs and, and asset prices. Uh, so it will seem like a Goldilocks scenario. Uh, and underneath that, as I, as I mentioned a little earlier, I think we're going to have two powerful forces uh, moving against one another, you know, this deflationary boom and the deflationary bust. And it's going to be perhaps somewhat confusing. Uh, and we'll see how the markets start sorting it out. And now I'd like to spend a little bit of time on innovation. We put out our Big Ideas report, uh, Big Ideas 2021, uh, a, a week or so ago. And um, we're really happy. It's at ark-invest.com. Uh, uh, and we're very happy that in the first, uh, I think it was in the first day, uh, we had uh, 100,000 hits compared to 58,000 for all of last year, our, our uh, Big Ideas 2020. So we're happy that uh, it's making an impact. We have a lot to share a lot of research to share, a lot of research conclusions to share. And I have to tell you, I, I do this full time. And, and when I pull back and just look at the big picture and where our research uh, suggests that uh, these trends are going, I have to tell you, I am even taken back sometimes when I think about the opportunities ahead of us. I'm just going to rattle off a few, uh, and the reason they are going to happen is because the, the, the costs associated with scaling these new technologies, the costs have come down low enough that they're opening up new markets. Um, battery costs uh, are an easy explanation. Uh, when we started the firm, uh, I think the, the question was, would electric vehicles ever be economic? Would they ever take off? And today, of course, we're looking at electric vehicle uh, prices soon to drop below uh, uh, gas powered car prices on a like for like basis. And by 2025, the average, uh, the average car like the Toyota Camry uh, of the electric vehicle space will be priced at $18,000 compared to $25,000, $26,000 for the average gas-powered car. Uh, and we know that electric cars are better from a couple of points of view, certainly uh, the environment, but also they're just better cars. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, use metrics like uh, zero to 60 miles per hour, how many seconds does that take? Um, so uh, we, we think for that, just that one um, part of the auto mar market is going to scale, this is a global number, uh, at an 82% compound annual rate during the next five years. Think about that, anything growing that much, people just don't believe that's going to happen, but we do. We think there will be a wholesale shift so that we go from 2.2 to 2.3 million 
electric vehicle cars sold last year to 40 million in five years. And that will be almost half of all cars sold globally. And we'll probably have entered the autonomous realm as well. Um, one of the reasons uh, autonomous will happen is because artificial intelligence training costs are dropping by 37% per year. And uh, we're seeing uh, the size of uh, artificial intelligence models growing by tenfold per year. Uh, so there's a huge amount of progress being made because the costs are dropping at such a rapid rate. And uh, we can make this progress now. One of the reasons these models are growing so quickly is that to do natural language processing takes time, 10 times the computing power that computer vision uh, demands. So, and we see the progress being made in natural language processing. I, I, I don't think we expected this for another five years. So even we have been taken aback at the progress. Uh, and I do believe a lot of it is associated with the costs coming down as rapidly as they are. Uh, we think that artificial intelligence is going to enable virtual worlds that um, I remember we used to talk about this 20 years ago, talking about how we would all be entering into virtual worlds with avatars and so forth. Um, well, I, I think virtual reality is on the cusp. And uh, we would have told you, there was a debate in the firm, but we would have told you on balance, uh, most of us did not expect it to take off five years ago. Uh, I listened to Unity Software, uh, um, John Riccatello, who uh, I knew uh, from Electronic Arts in the day. Uh, he's at Unity and he had uh, also been saying that he didn't think virtual reality was going to be a thing um, uh, about five years ago for quite some time. Now he says we're on the cusp. Uh, and this means uh, we, we will be uh, seeing virtual worlds converging and we will be evolving towards the metaverse. Uh, and we think there's a creative explosion and it's not just in gaming, it's probably in every sector. Again, artificial intelligence, a big part of that. Digital wallets, so bank branches in our pockets. We think this is a $4.6 trillion opportunity. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's just in the US. We think there will be 200 million uh, digital wallet holders. And again, these are gonna be our bank branches. And this is why the financial services sector is in harm's way, we believe. Uh, but the aha moment that we have had uh, in the last year, and we've been informed by what's happened in China, is that these digital wallets are going to be much more valuable than we once thought. We were defining that market in terms of financial services. But if you look at what happened uh, in China with Tencent, you'll see that half of the screen uh, is used for uh, digital commerce or uh, e-commerce uh, as well as social activities. Uh, so these digital wallets um, could become uh, could become the most valuable um, the most valuable uh, technology uh, technology developments per user um, of almost anything. Uh, so uh, we're pretty excited about that. And what's also interesting is to watch Cash App and uh, Venmo scale to surpass uh, JP Morgan in, uh, in the case of JP Morgan's uh, deposit holders, 60 million. Uh, Venmo was uh, there last year. Square has just about ca caught up. Uh, and if you, if you were to draw um, a graph as we did in Big Ideas, showing how JP Morgan got to those levels, it was one acquisition after the other. Whereas Cash App and Venmo, uh, because they're viral in nature, have, uh, have uh, gotten there uh, organically. Uh, so um, miles to go, lots of, lots of fun in that space. Uh, part of 
fintech uh, and digital wallets, of course, is um, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and we're astonished uh, to see, we're not astonished to see the price uh, elevate, we're, because we expected institutional to become a bigger part of uh, the equation, as we saw so, sort of the infrastructure moving into place. Uh, but what we didn't expect was uh, that, that uh, Bitcoin would uh, become a part of the balance sheets of institutions. Uh, so uh, Square, 1% of its assets, 2% of its cash is in Bitcoin. MicroStrategy, I think more than 100% of its cash is in, uh, in Bitcoin. And uh, just this week, uh, MicroStrategy hosted a conference for institutional investors to show them the way, uh, you know, good way to diversify your cash. And uh, given uh, everything going on in uh, the, the DeFi space, the decentralized uh, finance space, um, we wouldn't be surprised to see Ether moving in this direction. It's probably going to take a while. Uh, we think the, the, sh the, the, the more secure, the more secure uh, diversification into crypto uh, will be through, through Bitcoin. Uh, and then uh, uh, automation. Uh, it took the manufacturing industry in the United States 15 years to go from 20 robots per 10,000 uh, per 10,000 employees to 200. 15 years, uh, and that uh, that took place through 2015. Uh, we believe uh, that the same is about to happen about to happen to the entire economy, not just the manufacturing. We are right now at roughly 20 uh, robots per 10,000 employees in the US economy. We believe it will only take five years to get to 200. And a lot of, a lot of people uh, uh, are afraid when they hear that. Uh, they're thinking about their own jobs. Uh, but the history of technology is yes, there will be displacement, but the history is that it will create many more jobs uh, uh, than it will destroy. Uh, and uh, so we are not afraid of this. Uh, our brainstorm today, we had a, a, a big discussion about it. And one of the things we've learned from, from uh, technology is we have no idea how, uh, how many interesting new creative jobs are going to evolve during the next five years. Um, uh, maybe having to do with virtual worlds. Uh, we were also commenting on, you know, working fewer hours. Well, influencers on Instagram, that's a job. I don't think they are working eight hours a day. Maybe some are, uh, but I don't think uh, some of them need to do it and they're making a very fine living. So uh, work, the nature of work is going to change. And we were also talking about education as well. Uh, the nature of education is changing. Um, Elon Musk this week, I believe, said that his uh, school-age children are, um, are learning mostly through YouTube, and I think he said Twitter. It might have been another social uh, network. Uh, and uh, we have some folks on our brainstorm each week who are basically saying the same thing. They'll tune into us for innovation and then they go off to uh, YouTube to do a little more exploration. So I think the nature of education is changing and um, uh, we're pretty excited about that. One of the interesting thing about things about automation uh, that I think many people don't understand is that part of what happens is that previously unpaid labor shifts into paid labor. Uh, so you can imagine all the food preparation, the shopping, the preparation, the cooking, uh, the cleaning up. Now we have food delivery and we think uh, with drone technology uh, in five years, we're going to have uh, at least, uh, I've forgotten the exact number, but uh, a, a, an astonishing um, uh, amount of our food intake will be because a food delivery and we'll have uh, a wonderfully diverse, diverse uh, um, options, of course. 
uh, then uh, as part of automation, uh, autonomous uh, ride hailing. Uh, and we think it's ride hailing today is about a $150 billion market. We think it's going to six to seven trillion dollars by 2030. Uh, and at that point, it'll have um, uh, uh, about a trillion dollars in operating income. Well, if we're right, then by during the next five years, the market will start to discount that. And we think by the year 2025, uh, that the, the ride hailing cat, uh, category, most of it uh, autonomous, uh, will be approaching $4 trillion in market cap. Uh, so pretty, pretty astonishing moves ahead. If Tesla's right, 20% of miles driven uh, in North America uh, will be uh, autonomous uh, by the year 2025. Uh, we think it would be, we believe it's going to be closer to uh, seven or 8%. And uh, if, if we believed that Waymo was right, given the pace at which it's approaching this market, it'd be maybe 1%, not even 1%. Uh, so we think Tesla's uh, 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 probably relative to expectations um, much closer to the mark. And drones, drones are going to change our lives. Uh, if you uh, think there, there's going to be a collapse in transportation costs, because of course, drones are autonomous as well. Uh, and even the difference between remotely piloted, piloted drones uh, and uh, completely autonomous drones, the difference in, um, in uh, cost to send a package 10 miles would be $7.80 per mile for the remotely operated drone uh, versus 25 cents per mile. Now this is all at scale. Uh, in the early days, of course, everything costs, um, uh, costs much more than that, but we're, we're talking about uh, scale. So, uh, so, oh, and here I do have the statistic uh, we believe that by 2030, 19% of all food uh, deliveries will be by drones, uh, and that will be a $116 billion market. Another very interesting section in our big ideas is orbital aerospace. And if there's one space uh, that we've seen all of our technologies converging, uh, it is in orbital aerospace, and we think the opportunities there are vast as well in the uh, con global connectivity market, which is what a lot of people think about when they think about orbital uh, aerospace. They think about uh, all the satellites that uh, uh, SpaceX is sending out there to help with global connectivity. That's a $40 billion market, um, uh, uh, total available market. 10 billion of which, uh, believe it or not, is in the US, in our rural areas, uh, and 30 billion in the rest of the world. The bigger market, we believe, is hypersonic flight. So going from New York to Tokyo in two hours instead of 13 hours. We believe, and, and we believe our, our estimates are conservative. That's a $270 billion market. So think about that. I don't know what kind of multiple of sales you put on 270 billion for orbital aerospace. And of course, that's just the beginning if you, uh, if you believe uh, Elon Musk and are aiming for, for Mars. Uh, 3D printing, we think uh, the reason it is starting to take off uh, as so many other uh, innovations do is it solved problems during the coronavirus. Um, 3D printing uh, parts for ventilators, face shields, uh, and so forth. So uh, it is emerging from the valley of despair. And we think that there's a, 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 a combined with artificial intelligence, uh, we think this is a $120 billion market in five years. And then finally, uh, in the genomic space, uh, we, we focus on long read sequencing. Uh, which is going to be transformational. It is much more accurate uh, and reliable than short read sequencing. Which, uh, and so we're excited about um, the multi-screening cancer opportunity that uh, 
we think uh, by 2025, will reach a low enough cost with long read sequencing uh, so that um, it will pay, reimbursement will be there for those 40 and over. So we can all start screening earlier for this uh, disease associated with older age uh, and either prevent or cure, please God, with gene editing um, cancer in stage one. And finally, uh, I, one of the biggest breakthroughs in cancer we've had is immunotherapy, of course, where uh, the way we've described it historically, uh, we have, we are able uh, to train our own immune system to recognize and fight cancer. And that's with our own uh, T cells. Uh, well, now we're moving to off the shelf. Uh, what I've just described is very expensive uh, and, um, and, and, and very painful in some ways. Uh, the uh, new way is allogenic. So autologous is the old way allogenic, and there'll be a place for both of them, I'm sure, is really taking anyone's cells and training those cells to treat anyone else's um, body to fight and kill cancer. Uh, and we think that will be a $250 billion opportunity in the next five to 10 years. So lots of opportunity, lots of hope, lots of excitement. Uh, I hope you read our uh, Big Ideas to learn more about it, Big Ideas uh, 2021 at arc-invest.com. And uh, I hope uh, you have a great Super Bowl weekend. So thanks for listening.